Welcome to the founders of Web3 series by Outlier Ventures and me, your host, Jamie Burke. Together, we're going to meet the entrepreneurs, their backers, and the leading policymakers that are shaping Web3. Together, we're going to try to define what is Web3, explore its nuances, and understand the mission and purpose that drive its founders. If you enjoy what you hear, please do subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission that is Web3. So today we've got Artur Sitchoff of Somnium Space, uh, which is Latin for the dream, and they describe themselves as an open, social, and persistent VR platform built on blockchain. Welcome, Artur. Hello. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me. So one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on, you're one of the kind of rising stars, one of the rising founders uh, in the Web3 space. And in particular, I think it's really interesting looking at how uh, technologies like VR, AR, you know, mixed reality are converging with blockchain. Um, at Outlier, we've been a big advocate of the kind of convergence thesis, which we set about probably four years ago now, looking at how these different technologies combine. And I would say, you know, looking from a VR lens, uh, you guys are certainly the, the kind of startup that's driving the most traction in that space. So um, before we get started, it would be good to kind of get a, a bit of an overview on your background. As I understand it, uh, originally you studied investment banking in Prague. You've also done an MBA. You worked at Citigroup for a while doing FX from what I could see, and then uh, electricity trading at Eon and a couple of other companies. Uh, right. Oh, you did a, you did a good research. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, thanks again for, for having me. Yeah. So I've, uh, I've started investment banking in Prague. Um, I actually didn't work for city, but I, um, I joined their, uh, international challenge. They call it an FX challenge. And what they do is basically they, they simulate the real market environment in, in, in groups of people. So they choose from all the country, like top, I don't know, 20, 30 people. And then you run the simulation and then you, you act like a bank um, and then the bank which earns most of the money wins this um, this Boris game. It's called a Boris game and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've won the most uh, speculative capital award there. So I've <laughs> generated, I think, five folds of what other banks have been able to generate uh, between each other. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I've, I've traded power derivatives uh, for... Uh, for investment bank in, in, in Prague. And then I, I was recruited or invited to work for German energy utility, the biggest one. Um, so I worked there as energy trader as well. So yeah, that was kind of the whole, uh, the whole background. But I've used, you know, I used to be, uh, and I'm still is obviously the, uh, the uh, player of games, uh, kind of like <laughs> Ultima Online from 1999 and Second Life. I've been involved in that from the very beginning. So, And this is your second startup, right? So you did something called Easy Charge. Uh, right. Is that still going or? Um, um, no, it was, uh, it was, so I'm not, I'm not there anymore. Um, what I did is basically I've created a, um, um, new type of electric car, car charging stations because I'm a huge fan of electric cars. Um, you know, they're fun and they're great. Uh, Teslas obviously are a lot of fun to drive, but, uh, you know, I created a new type of charging station for electric cars and I kind of, you know, took it from just a paper idea I had uh, drawn on the paper to a real product, which is able, you know, to be manufactured by thousands um, in various countries in the world. And it's patented in more than 10 countries and stuff. And then I, I sold that startup. So. That's how I. That's how I got it. And so, uh, at what point did you decide to kind of uh, move out of that space? You know, around I guess energy and uh, energy technology, and make the leap into into Somnium. I guess uh, it, it was kind of you're living the dream. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, uh, it was it was not an immediate transition, but let's say the first the first bell rang when I was a trader, and I kind of um, had this urge to start my own company. And I had, you know, always a lot of ideas and I live with the motto of uh, vision without execution is hallucination because if you dream about something, but you don't actually execute that, it's nothing. Uh, many people have a lot of good ideas, but you know, not many people execute them well. So I kind of started to think, you know, how can I do some tech startups, some tech ideas? And I went through some three circles of hell, you know, with some trying out and, and, and failing with some smaller ideas, obviously, some, you know, mobile apps and stuff. But then um, 
in late 2016, I got a chance to, um, to try um, the early version of HTC Vive at that point, a pre-production version of HTC Vive, the, the headset, the original one. And, uh, you know, being involved in all the virtual worlds like Ultima Online and Second Life and trying that at that time kind of clicked all the puzzle, puzzle pieces together for me. And I just literally, I mean, I know it sounds super cheesy, but I, I literally had this idea in front of my eyes when I tried it. I said, wow, this is such a powerful tech. And, you know, I, I knew about earlier attempts of, of VR, but nothing was even close to what that was for me because it was a room scale VR with, you know, great tracking at that time and everything was perfect. So I basically was not able to think about anything else from that moment on. And I was thinking, what could you do uh, with all with that technology, what everything would be possible within the next five years, and I truly believed, uh, and I told everyone I, I met that you know within five six years, everybody will have um, a headset on their table next to the mobile phone, and it will be something they will be using daily. So I mean, we have one year to go still, so hopefully that will be the reality. I mean, I it's you're already doing a reality. Okay. I think exactly. it's okay. I mean, exactly. I, I um, you try and buy an Oculus right now, and it's it's impossible. It's so, so, exactly. So a year ago, I wouldn't have believed you, but I, I kind of, um, uh, with everything that's going on with Corona in a macro sense, I think if anything, it's, it's accelerated this, this demand. Yeah. So that, that was kind of the beginning of, of, you know, I started to think and, you know, having my own experience with virtual worlds and a lot of experience, I've spent a lot of time playing those. I kind of shaped and, you know, read a lot of books and you know, all the books we know, and it kind of shaped in my, in my, in my view. And, uh, you know, I said, okay, that, that's what I believe. The, the virtual world and platform uh, has to be, and that's what I want to, to build. So what's different now compared to Second Life and, and why blockchain? So when I look at how you describe the, the kind of implementation of the Somnium space, it says you're tokenizing in-game assets, land parcels, and you're kind of delivering this cross-platform VR client. You've got a series of SDKs, builders, and, and everything else. So what, what are the learnings from Second Life and why is the introduction of blockchain, why does that, why does that accelerate this vision or make, make new things possible? Absolutely. So I think there's a big difference between Second Life and what we do. And the biggest one is virtual reality, right? I'm a big believer and it's, I'm not just a believer. Um, I, I think it's a fact that when you try something in VR, when you are able to immerse your body and trick your brain into VR and, you know, let your brain believe that you are somewhere in a different location. That's what today's VR already delivers very well. When you are able to do that, it, it makes you attach to things and world which you are immersing yourself in much stronger. So I remember vividly sitting in Second Life in 2005, four, I don't know, uh, the year already, and looking at the virtual sunset which, you know, at that time was pretty primitive. And, and looking at the water and at sunset and saying, wow, I believe and I, I want to be on the other side of the monitor so much. I would give a lot of money, like everything I have to just be able to dive into that world and explore what I've built, explore what other people have built and just be there, right? And that is exactly what we have built today. That was exactly what you can do in Somnium. Now, People are still spending a lot of time and money uh, in Second Life for virtual avatars, for things you know they, they, they buy and sell, for houses and stuff. But whenever you are able to build something and dive into VR directly and share it with you know, thousands of people immediately, and on top of that, you own that asset for real, right? Whatever you build in Second Life and you buy their Linden dollars, this is the asset they own. This is the asset it's, which is on, you know, on their servers. This is something which they may allow or may not allow you to buy, sell, and trade, depending on their you know, desire or whatever they decide to do with that. It ties to your account. If you are banned, which many people were, you lose everything you have. You have zero control over your assets. In terms of Somnium and tokenization of, uh, of your real assets, that's a complete the opposite story. You own the token for the land. Even if you ban you, you still own the token and you can go and sell uh, that token for, you know, for the market price. You can transfer that token to someone else without even asking us as a Somnium, you know, what are, we, are you allowing me to do that? 
no, you just do it. And people do it already today, right? They just build something on the land parcel, they transfer the token, and then the bill goes to the other person, and that person uses this. So this is the freedom and kind of decentralization and the start of decentralization of economy. And we believe from the day one, this is needed if we want to bring and create an experience which will last for you know next 50 years or maybe 100 years if we're lucky. So that's why we brought blockchain, and that's why we fully believe, and I'm absolutely committed uh, and, and convinced that VR is the next um, you know, medium where people will be spending more and more time because of the ability to trick your brain and believe that you are somewhere else. Really, this is kind of an extension of the idea of custody of digital assets rather than it being a cryptocurrency. It's uh, NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens. And I guess this is where you talk about security of ownership, authenticity of origin, and this persistency, the idea that your identity, your associated assets can kind of live forever. They're immortal almost. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, and, and one thing we are very different from anything else out there is we are persistent. And when I say persistent, there is, um, I mean it technically, and, and you just not to dive in too deep into the technicality, but um, if you imagine any other game out there right now, or 99% of the games, they are dividing players into sub-servers and rooms. So whenever you have like, you know, be it Counter-Strike or Fortnite, 100 people at the same time, be it, you know, any other VR world, uh, you know, like VR chat and all space, you have rooms of 40 people. And then whenever 41st person comes in, they spawn a new room. And uh, the point is, you don't see and communicate between those rooms. You cannot see the other player in the other room. In our opinion, it, it, it breaks immersion. Uh, you know, if we, in, if we envision the world with, you know, a Ready Player One style where people are all the time and they are kind of really going into this deep social um, uh, experiences, they all have to be in one world. So that's why we developed our own server architecture to actually hold you know, hundreds and thousands of people in the, in the server together at all the time in one world. That's a big difference. So you can really right now climb the mountain. That's what we experience every day. Either sit, stay in city center and see three kilometers away on the mountain, someone in the night walking on the mountain and you can see the dot you know walking there and you can see that that's you know that person is actually there persistently and you can see him and he can see you and you know the whole world is alive so that's a big difference what we what we put on the table and why i think people are excited about us yeah and so you know you picked up uh, people like robert scoble who's you know big vr guy ex microsoft um he's a big fan of yours uh, actually how i heard of you was him tweeting about some of the stats about oh, the awesome. blockchain and, and the type of assets. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of come to that a little bit later. Um, I was recently looking at the Somnium Times, and um, I, I think that's a really interesting kind of culture that you've got forming around there. But I just want to stay at a kind of meta level. So, uh, you know, you refer to this thing called the metaverse, and I imagine <clears> to <throat> most people that seems quite abstract. Could you, could you unpack? The metaverse and the relationship you see it has with web3 right um i think metaverse you know when i speak about metaverse i don't mean only somnium um that is very important to understand i think metaverse is a combination of different worlds and experiences which are seamless and interconnected you know there's a big notion of people who believe you know if facebook comes with the horizon they will is the only social platform in the world no they won't and you know the true metaverse is having several virtual worlds be it vr chat out space and then horizon in the future and somnium but you know be crypt you know be, be interconnected in a way that you can seamlessly go from one experience into another in vr and experience that and take with you your identity your money and sometimes your items your avatar and many more things thus creating this one seamless huge um, metaverse as in a universe call it, call it however you like right but right. you create this one huge uh, instance of everybody else uh, and everybody being together interconnected and that that brings a lot of value for the user and that brings a lot of value for those worlds and maybe it sounds counterproductive in the beginning when you say ah, you know how do you why don't you want to become the only uh, you know, world, uh, social world out there and beat everybody and just be the one and collect everything. I, first of all, I don't believe it will be fun to be tied up to one, to one uh, metaverse, uh, to one world, to one company. Um, and second of all, I don't believe this will be the case. People are different. Someone likes to go to, you know, Minecraft. Someone likes to, 
you know, jump into Outspace, um, but then go to the party into VR chat and then go to their house into Somnium space. That's what actually ha is happening in reality. Um, and it will continue like that. Our part as Somnium and other companies is to work out the interoperability between each other and make those transitions seamless. Um, and I think blockchain plays and will play a huge role in that in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. We have an, um, a startup going through our London accelerator at the moment. When I say London, it's slightly virtualized now, but called Crucible, and they're working on portability of identity and uh, virtual goods through self-sovereign identity specific to VR and gaming. So oh, um, cool. I, I think that uh, you know, that's a, a particular challenge that we're, we're spending a lot of time working on at the moment is, is that portability. But it's, it's interesting, and I, I guess this is what would make you a Web3 founder, is rather than trying to create a platform, which would be very Web2, you're trying to create a, a network that coexists within a network, so a, ne a network of networks. Yes, yes. I think, of course, we are a platform, and, and at some point we give a lot of tools for people to create and you know, exist on our, on our platform and um, create experiences. But you know, you have to think one way, you know, one level up, um, and and that level up is a very important one. So we try to build our platform, our you know, experience in a way that it's compatible and open for the future interactions with other worlds. And we do speak with some, you know, with some with some worlds already, and we we do have plans to you know how to make it happen. Uh, but of course, everything has to be done step by step. Yeah. And so when you say open, um, to you, what does open mean? Is is any or you know parts of what you do open source or is it more from a per permissioning perspective when you say open? uh both um so the first step it's uh permissioning so you know you don't ask us a permission to own something you don't ask us a permission to sell something you don't ask us a permission to be there it's yours and you decide you know what do you do how we do it and when you do it and then of course open source is the big topic i personally uh, like when something is open source, but I also, you know, realize that there has to be a very good guidelines in things companies are doing and that not necessarily open source means wide adoption. I think it has to be reasonably, how, how, how to try to, 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 it has to be reasonably well managed until it becomes to the point where it can be open source, if that makes sense, right? So it's a pathway, you, yeah. So you're exactly. not starting. You, you yeah. kind of just say, you know, okay, now we're all open source and you do whatever. People will just don't know what to do with that. If you show them the path and if you show them what things are, you know, are able to be done or they're able to be, to be doing on, 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 on your platform, then you can come to the point where you can open source some parts of it or maybe all of it and, uh, and, let, it, and let it live. I've seen numerous examples where great platforms you know were created and then just nobody used and cared and even you know them going open source didn't help to this adoption even though they had potential so this is i think that there has to be a path which has to be managed and then in the end of the day you can open source open source parts or everything and then uh, and then let it live its own life and we are definitely so, thinking about that in the future of course so you talk about this kind of decoupling decoupling somnium space from the operational database. And so I guess that is, that's also a pathway as well, a pathway to decentralization. It sounds like by default, there are some things that are naturally decoupled. And then presumably there are other elements that will be increasingly decoupled or, or um, decentralized. Exactly like this, yes. So, um, you know, the blockchain definitely provides a first step towards decentralization. And then, um, you know, we can talk about decentralization of servers, right? Uh, we can talk about decentralization of, you know, information flow of everything. This will happen, but it will happen in the future. And it cannot happen now just because it will be too early for, for mass adoption and it will be too early for, uh, for anyone to even enjoy that. So, yeah. And so if we look at what's actually happening um, on the platform or in, in the network, I assume the easiest way to do that is Somnium Times. At least that's where I went. And It's an amazing, yeah, it's an amazing source. So, so there it kind of shows there's... There's a culture component, so live events, there's education, learning, and you're actively uh, recruiting for, for reporters. From what I could see... It's not I don't us. Know how... it's not... Keep in mind that this is a 100% user-generated idea and content. Okay. We as a okay. company have nothing to do with it. And the funny part was it emerged suddenly uh, by one of our users. He created this, uh, this web page, this newspaper from Virtual World, 
he just sent me the link. He already pre-wrote some articles and he just sent me a link and I opened it and I said, wow, wait a second. Is that, if that's, if that's for real, you know, this is the real newspaper from virtual reality world. And yeah, many users already are on board, writing articles, doing experiences and, you know, uh, some, some tickets and, uh, and, and uh, events and stuff. And it's amazing. I, I, I'm reading it every day. I mean, it's interesting. I, I imagine at some point they'll become a, a political dimension to those societies that are forming <laughs> on there. And, you know, you can imagine that there'll be town mayors and, uh, and all, all sorts happening on top. We actually want to have something like that. We even have uh, plans to, to do something like this because we, you know, we already listen to our community very carefully. We, I am engaged with community as much as I can possibly, right? I'm talking to everyone all the time. I'm at every event. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, testing and, 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 and deciding and doing, and doing research with them. You're persistent um, as well, right? Uh, exactly. And I try to be as much as I can. Uh, because first of all, I know in the first place, I've built this world for myself. Right? I wanted to live in that world. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm uh, enjoying it uh, every day. But um, in terms of people being active, absolutely. This is the part of, of things. And I think having a virtual election where people will choose their uh, represent representative to, to, to be involved in Somnium, decision some sort of would be absolutely cool and i think we have nothing against that and we'll we'll support those ideas and we hope something like this will emerge yeah i mean you could imagine uh, i recently did an interview with somebody from meta cartel and uh, looking at you know how DAOs are really manifesting this this convergence between gaming culture and, and hacker culture um initially from the ethereum community in how they uh, can coordinate public goods, you know, their control, grant mm -hmm. giving, and you could imagine definitely emerging of DAOs and these, these virtual spaces and environments. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think, uh, you know, this is an inevitable path to, uh, uh, to, 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 to that road, right? And we see already some kind of new, new things like this are happening where people are naturally gathering inside the world in in, you know, like there is a disco district in Somnium, which just emerged like <laughs> as a district because one person built a disco, another person built a disco, and then suddenly there are three, four discos around and it's a disco district. Then another one, you know, another district suddenly, which emerged like yesterday or day before yesterday is uh, a entertainment. Uh, you know, there are some slides, there are some, some games, some rides. So this is, I think, the first um, iteration of community decisions, but it's all organic. Uh, and I think we'll see more and more of that. So, I mean, I can imagine if we you know, think about VR and some of the industries that are the early adopters of these technologies, I can imagine certain districts happening. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you do about it? Do you, um, so right yeah. now, you're, of course, whenever, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. So whenever, we, we, uh, whenever you upload something to some new, you have to agree with terms and conditions. Of course, you, you cannot upload something which is more violent and, and you know, it has to be according to your, you know, your, your law uh, and to your country. But in terms of the district, it's a very easy solution which we're working on to implement. So basically, it will be like this. If you upload a major content uh, on your parcel, which you know you will be able to do, it will automatically be flagged as um, you know an 18 plus parcel. Now, people who will not verify their edge, and again, we don't ask people to do a full QIC one while onboarding on Somnium. That you know, it's it's just a platform for enjoying VR, enjoying content. But those parcels will be invisible for you, and you will have to. You know, you'll see that some it's written for you. You have to do a full KYC or confirm your age in order to see that parcel content. And if you do, you will see that. If you won't, you won't. That's a very easy uh, solution for that. And you know, whoever will be uh, uh, roaming the world and you know will want to see those uh, those parcels and that content will have to do a, a you know a simple age verification KYC and then they will be free to enjoy that uh, that content. Yeah, it's a very elegant solution actually. So it's, it's opt in rather than um, restricted by default. So if we look at some of the things that are happening on there, the, the latest figures that I could find, you know, as of uh, the beginning of April. It were transaction value increase of 150%, I think that was by month, to 500 ETH. Mm -hmm. And I think the all-time value of 2099, was that right? Correct. And now it's assets, much higher, or not much, now it's already higher, but uh, that's, that's right about the, the numbers we're we we seeing right now. Right. And then the assets was uh, 5,411 
which was land, teleporters, tents, kayaks, 447 unique holders. And, uh, and this is how I originally f uh, heard of you guys, was that Robert Scoble tweeting um, that the, the biggest sale happened now, the biggest transaction, which was 10x land parcels or 10XL uh, land mm -hmm. parcels plus one teleport, uh, teleportation hub for mm -hmm. 100 ETH, which at the time was about 13,000 US dollars. We already beaten that record, or not we, those players are really, we have beaten this record. So recently uh, there was five parcels sold for 100 uh, ETH, which at that time uh, was around about 14 and a half thousand dollars. But you know, it's not 10 parcels, already five parcels. And yesterday, for example, I mean, those trades, not those high, not, not such huge trades, but every day there are some trades happening. Um, and like one person has bought a parcel on the main island, one parcel for 20 ETH, which is around about three and a half thousand dollars yesterday. So there is an economy which is ongoing. And, and the beauty of it is, you know, we, we don't control it in, in, in terms, right? People are deciding the price by themselves. Price can drop, price can rise depending on how good we are performing, right? If we are, as a company, performing well, if we are adding features and if the value of the parcel grows because the things you can do on the parcel are, you know, growing the ability of you to monetize the parcel or to actually create some, you know, sentimental value for you or some other value for you, whatever you decide to do with that, then there is, you know, no reason why wouldn't the parcel uh, values go up because you can do more with it uh, and you can earn money with that uh, by, you know, placing some cool experiences on that parcel like you know disco club and stuff but that's you know that's decided by market um, and we 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 are just watching it and we are amazed so you have all these nfts happening your bottom up organically is there a somnium token where people participate in you know, the underlying protocol so there is an erc20 token uh, which is a utility token used to, you know, to pay for things inside the world. And it will be used more and more for in-game purchases, in-game transactions, and uh, in-game, you know, exchanging the in-game value. So this already exists. It's called Somium Cubes. You can find more information about that on, you know, our website. You can go through Economy Paper, uh, which is published there. You can have a look on the exchange where those cubes are traded. But that's, you know, that's the, that's the general idea. You have a token of, you know, in-game token and that utility token allows you to, you know, utilize as, as well, you utilize your experience inside the world. You can sell some stuff for that. You can buy some things for that. Um, and in general, exist in that world uh, with that, with that in-game uh, token. And so I guess, you know, here it's really functioning as an as a in-game currency in, in this world. And you, you said that there's an economics paper there, but you know, often projects have had to employ economists to think through this, this virtual or digital economy that, that's gonna happen on top of their protocol. But I guess in this instance, how, how much effort was put into that? Because clearly, I mean, if this becomes one of the larger virtual environments or virtual worlds, you know, the monetary policy of that could be incredibly important. If you imagine it scales to the point of a Facebook, which is, you know, bigger than its population is bigger than most countries. Yeah, were Facebook to have a monetary policy, you know, you would want to be able to presumably change that. You, you would want it to upgrade it or adapt it. What's the thinking there? Uh, look, we, uh, of course, you know, we being us, me and some other people in the, in, in the company, uh, you know, our chief operating officer, for example, we both have you know, combined like 20 years of training experience and we, you know, I'm an investment banker by my studies and I have financial MBA in, 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 uh, in, in general. So there is some knowledge out there. And of course, I'm not saying we know everything, but we've put some thought into it. And I think the foundation is laid, laid there and, and, and people can look at it and, and, and see the direction we are going with it. But the beauty of you know, the centralized worlds and the centralized economy is that it will evolve independently of we want it to evolve to, right? We, we cannot, to an ultimate extent, we cannot control it. We are not second life with Linden dollars where we can just shut down the dollar or just day by day exchange, you know, keep the rate at some point or say the rate is this and, you know, you cannot do anything. There's already free market for Somnium Cubes. You know, we cannot influence the, the and we don't want too much, you know, influence the exchange rate. It's people are deciding, you know, whether they need those tokens to buy a roller coaster ride inside Somnium. They didn't need a token and they will go and buy the token because they want to ride that uh, roller coaster or they want to buy the avatar or they want to 
buy a disco ticket, uh, you know, anything you envision, you imagine they will be actually doing for those people. So I think, again, it kind of ties to, you know, if our economy will be growing and if 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 people will be creating more and more uh, more and more experiences for people to 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 have then there will be more utility for that token and that's how it will it will evolve and whether the price will go up or down you know there's so many factors uh coming into play starting from you know uh, exchange rate of ETH and to the dollar to the cubes it's it's all interconnected so we cannot control it ultimately and and that's i think the beauty of it i hope okay. i answered your question yeah no absolutely so i was just i was trying to understand you know whether it was a fixed supply and what was minted is minted oh um, right there is uh, there is so we minted 100 million somnium cubes uh, that's 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 the you can check it in the in the contract of course right and you're kind of just letting it do its thing um, in a kind of free market Pretty much exactly that, right? We, we, we have a plan in the economy paper which we outline of how we'll be selling those tokens step by step, right? We'll be selling some parts of the token at some prices at the beginning, and then after some you know, moment of time, we'll just let it free float and a market decides what, what it worth. Got you. And so as an entrepreneur, and I also see that you list yourself as a, an angel investor, I guess once you've birthed this new world and it, it's kind of got a life of its own, are you looking at investing in or building commercial businesses around it in it um you know we it's an interesting um it's an interesting uh aspect and it's a great question so you know i have to i have to kind of be at the same or at different chairs at the same time so i'm i'm you know i'm founder and ceo of some new space right so i'm building that metaverse together with the team right trying to make as much as many tools as possible for people to be creative and to be able to monetize their abilities. On the other hand, yes, I'm an angel investor myself. I invested in and in, still do in several companies, and I try to invest in the companies where I see a huge synergy with what we do at Somnium. Just because naturally, I believe that you know that's the space I want to be involved in. You know, be it blockchain, be it VR. Um, I did some medical uh, startups investment, but you know this this is kind of how the, the 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 new age technology what I believe in, and I think will be definitely changing the scope of uh, and and the, and the way how we perceive the world. And again, in the third the third part, of course, I have some land parcels which I had to buy on the on on the on the real market because we have a rule in the company nobody gets any free land, so we all had to go and compete with anybody with everybody on the initial land offering to actually you know, get some land. And I wanted some spots, which I didn't get because some people just paid more. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is <laughs> exactly. So this is, this is funny. And I have to, you know, I'm also building some things, you know, with my kids as well uh, on some parcels I have. I'm building some, thinking about some businesses I want to run inside that world. And, you know, on the fourth level, we're actually, you know, as Somnium as a company, we're also a startup, right? We're also a company which, you know, constantly talks to investors like we do right now, you know, and thinking what's the best for us, whether we are, you know, doing the round now and how we are going to, uh, you know, scale and all these kind of things come together. So I have to kind of be in the four, four seats at the same time and try to balance balance it out and be very fair. And I think so far we're succeeding in that. So hopefully we will we'll continue doing that. So it's interesting you mentioned that you're in there doing some things with your kids. and. It does kind of trigger the question, in, in a world where we have all these digital assets, how, how could your family inherit what you have? How do you make sure that they can claim custody of that, you know, should the worst happen? And equally, how might these, this kind of new digital asset be taxed if it's seen as land and that you might rent out at some point? Is that, you know, capital gains? Do, does that occupy you much either intellectually or, or practically at this stage so believe it or not we had a, unfortunately we had a case of someone dying and we you know we were in touch with um that person's family and that person's family got his land parcel and they actually gave that land parcel to someone else to build a virtual reality school and devoted wow. to his name because he was um an educator and he wanted to build a virtual reality school. So unfortunately, you know, he passed away and, and we had this we had this situation and absolutely this unfortunately will be happening, you know, in the future when the number of users are, you know, growing. And I, I cannot say that we have like an automated system for that, no, but we take 
it very seriously and we you know we uh we've spent time to talk to this to family and to you know to make sure that you know that's they're there and what they want to do with this and to transfer token to right people and stuff like this so absolutely we'll have to be dealing with this in the future and uh, there's no way we can go around that um you know we can of course talk to about live forever modes and things we are preparing to to roll out this year to make to make to make up actually for imperfections of our lives because we're not uh, living there <laughs> indefinitely but uh, yeah so this is this is the things we we definitely already had uh, our uh, had to deal with um and in terms of in terms of you know capital gains and stuff we are of course as the company we are you know obliging to all the rules um and local rules and european rules we have to uh but in general you know people have to also take care of their tax returns and they have to kind of show whether they've made some money on uh, on trading uh, some crypto or or doing that, and we, how to say, we evolve with the market together, right? We don't have answers to everything, but we try to be as transparent as possible um, and as open as possible to you know regulators and to 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 um, local authorities uh, if needed, and uh, we'll continue doing so, right? We we this this business in general, this this area is evolving so fast. That I think even regulators are actually learning a lot uh, during this, um, and you know, from what I'm hearing from you know US SEC, listening to some interviews from them, majority of people are pretty much common sense, right? They don't want to kill the industry; they just want to, it to be uh, fair and open and transparent. And I think we are we are supporting that idea, and that thus will uh, will will be working towards this mission um, in the future. So that's what I can say about how we approach this. Uh, this situation. Yeah, I mean, you should definitely speak to a guy called uh, Pateris Zilgalvis, who um, leads the European Commission's Digital Single Market Initiative and also blockchain. Um, I had him on the show uh, recently. He is very pro innovation. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of interesting questions that get raised when you take, you know, digital assets and NFTs into this context of lives and property and, and stuff like that. Uh, so I can see that you've had a number of partnerships as well, some kind of, I guess, within the Web3 ecosystem like Matic, and then also organizations like Sony, Pimax, Admix, and uh, even Liberland has a virtual embassy. Can you talk through some of those partnerships and, and how that all manifests? Um, absolutely. So if we talk about Sony, we, you know, Sony has a, um, an app, a scanning app, which is called 3D Creator. And what that app uh, is doing is basically you can take your mobile phone and scan any object with your normal camera. Um, and then it creates a 4K model of that object or of your face. And what we did an experimental kind of build and somewhere in the, on YouTube, there's a video where you can basically ask someone to scan yourself within three minutes. And then you can you know, place your, yourself into VR and be yourself. So that was kind of an experiment we did, and it worked. And you know, we we think what we can do with this to, uh, in, the, in in the next level. And uh, we worked on with Sony on that. So that was interesting. Um, in terms of Pimax, Pimax is one of the known, very known uh, headset VR headset manufacturers, one of the most high end uh, VR manufacturers. And uh, they actually opened the first virtual reality showroom um, inside Somnium. Um, oh, so that cool. was that was awesome. So you can kind of go there and watch YouTube reviews and take uh, the headset into the hand and kind of feel the scale of the headset and kind of look around. It's kind of the next level of shopping, right? Not looking in the images on the website, rather than actually taking your uh, your your stuff you want to buy, looking at it, understanding the scale, the quality, the build quality, and then maybe per making a purchase. So that was interesting. In terms of Admix, great company. Uh, they are doing. Um, they are doing the, uh, and that's an, that's an example of, uh, of what you know. Me being an investor, I'm an investor in Admix, and okay. they are doing VR uh, programmatic ads. And you know, once I heard that, and you know, once we connected with the with the founder, I immediately you know immediately envisioned that it fits into the vision we do in Somnium. So basically, every land owner will be able to place a banner. Uh, on their land parcel, or not even the banner, maybe a 3D object. So you place a, you create a house, and you have a living room. And there is a TV. Right now in Somnium, you can place a generic TV screen, which is the black TV. With Admix, you know, we'll be able to very soon to place a Sony TV inside the house. For you as a user experience, that changes almost nothing. Actually, it makes more sense to have some kind of a more 
uh, familiar brands out there in your house. It makes your house to feel more real for your, you know, for people who visit your house. But then every time someone turns on TV or looks at the TV in VR, you as the house owner, you get paid from Sony, for example, or from Samsung, whatever that brand will be. So AdMix is kind of, it's in between the brands and the final experience, managing the brands' um, inputs with their, you know, what they want to advertise and the experiences like Somnium Space, what they want to showcase. And in our case, as the world, it makes a lot of sense because people, you know, will be creating those experiences using those uh, advertised assets like Coca-Cola cans, for example. And you can, you, you imagine what it could be, right? So this this brings people an ability to monetize their land parcel right away. Wow, very powerful stuff. So Arthur, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. I think anybody that listens to this, if they aren't already you know, intellectually fascinated by the idea of metaverse, I'm sure many are going to go down that rabbit hole now. So um, thanks for your time. It's really appreciated and good luck with the metaverse. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a huge pleasure being here. And uh, yeah, uh, we welcome every newcomer to the rabbit hole. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission of Web3.